Okay, our next question is, why are there three connected festivals? Right? And, and when I was first in the church, it was like Passover, and this year Passover was a Sunday night. And so I did all the preparation and got all organized and went to Passover. And then the next day was an ordinary day, except that night, once the sun had set, it was like, oh, yeah, time for a big meal, <laughs> right? And then you had the big meal, you went home to bed. The next morning, ah, holy day. So, so you could almost think that Passover is not connected to unleavened bread, but the instant Passover day, the 14th ends, the 15th begins, and so they're joined at the hip. Okay, then during unleavened bread, and in this case yesterday, right, Wave sheaf day, the first day of the count, began. And today is the second day of the wave sheaf count. And when unleavened bread stops, then the wave sheaf, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit Festival, keeps on going for a huge amount of time <coughs> if we're mindful of it. And that's why, that's why I talk about the, the, uh, the reading of the hundred scriptures about the Holy Spirit. You know, we need to remind ourselves that, that Passover and Unleavened Bread and the Festival of Weeks or the Holy Spirit Festival, they all are teaching spiritual lessons. They begin with some physical things to do, but they point us to spiritual things to do every single day of the rest of our lives. So Jesus and the Father have designed the springtime growing festival season. You know... You know, when do you know it's spring? The, but the trees bud out. Down in Texas, the, the white dogwood. The, the dogwood trees. I go riding my bike early in the morning, and whoo, you, you come riding through the trees, and like, boom, the white of a dogwood tree in full bloom. It's like, oh, must be almost Passover time. Yeah, it is. You know, so the growing season. Has, God has joined them all together because he wants babes in Christ to be growing, right? These first three, plus the weekly Sabbath Holy Convocation Assembly, are models for how to feed and fuel and grow stronger in our new spiritual creature in Christ. We've become a new creature in Christ, but then Bible references, the, those who are weak in the church take care of, help them. They're babes in Christ. They're still on milk, you know. Ephesians 4.21, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, if you paid attention to Christ and you're learning from the scriptures of your Bible as the truth is in Jesus, right? Verse 22 of Ephesians 4, that you put off concerning your former conduct, your worldly practices, you have to put them away. Stop doing those, right? And the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful, deceitful lusts. So you're, you're either in the world getting worse and worse and worse, or you've been baptized, you've made the commitment, you're feeding on Christ, you're avoiding worldliness, you're practicing the truth and spiritual ways of doing things, and you're growing stronger and stronger. And in the case of the Corinthians, they, they do a little bit of growing stronger, and then they do a bunch of growing weaker, and a little bit of growing stronger and growing weaker. And so were they growing stronger? No, the net result is they were growing weaker. Right? By mixing. So, verse 23. And be renewed. I looked that word up in the Greek. Renovated. Everybody knows what renovated means. Right? You take out the old stuff you don't want anymore. You get rid of it. <laughs> and you put in. Do you put it? Did you go somewhere to Goodwill and you buy some old raggedy furniture? You take out the furniture you had and you put in the old raggedy furniture? <laughs> You put in new, better stuff. You put in better. Renovate means you're putting in the better stuff in the spirit of your mind. And, uh, you know, I looked up the Greek definition. It says this word means to renovate, right, or reform. Oh, and they use renew. Okay. Renovating is taking out the old stuff, installing new, top quality furnishing, right? Very few people I know want to replace a relatively good table with a less good table. They want a better table or a TV. You know, people, I see people leaving Walmart now carrying TV. <laughs> TV's this big. And then I heard on a cruise ship, they now have 
when your cabin's on the inside where you can't see the sea, they've got a whole wall and a camera. The camera's out looking at the sea and projecting into the whole wall. And so you don't have a balcony, but in a sense you can see what all the people with balconies are seeing. You know, so I guess if you get seasick by looking at the ocean, you turn it off. <laughs> I don't know. But anyhow, big TV screens are the thing these days. So you put off the former conduct, you renew or get renovated, and you're supposed to be installing the top quality furnishings or the Jesus knowledge plus the Jesus practices. Verse 24. And that you put on the new man which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So there's that unleavened bread theme again. You know, anything leavened is not true. It's sinful for the days of unleavened bread. And you're supposed to be feeding on Christ the true righteousness and holiness. Holy, yeah, the holiness. So six days, your self-study, which is extremely important. Don't just leave it to the Sabbath. Six days of self-Bible study plus the Sabbath group studies you have when you come to the church and you share ideas, this is how you grow stronger. Unleavened bread is a part of it. Passover is a part of it. The Festival of Weeks is a part of it and the others too. So renovating needs knowledge of what to do and the energy and the skill to do it well. Okay, you go to boot camp as a soldier, you learn the knowledge of what to do. If your gun jams... You can't sit down and cry. You gotta fix it. You gotta know how to fix your jammed gun or you're dead, right? So you get the knowledge of what to do. Then if you're out in the, you know, in the battle lines or whatever, and you haven't eaten for three or four days and you have no energy, it's like, well, I know what to do. I just don't have the strength to do it. <laughs> you got you gotta know what to do and you gotta have the strength to do it. And you gotta have the skill. You know, if you're going to stay alive, you've got to have the skill to do it well, right? If you're going to disarm a bomb, right, you don't want a novice going in to disarm the bomb in your living room. You want somebody who knows what to do and has the strength not to fall over while he's trying to do it and has the skill to do it well. And then he comes out of your living room and says, don't worry, it's all fixed, it's disarmed. Oh, good, you know. So we've been given a seven boot camp days of basic knowledge that, that one, the obedience, two, the watch out for mixing. Don't be mixing the leaven in with the non-leaven, right? And then, um, <clears throat> then we add to that the spiritual understanding that goes on top of that, right? So we've learned the basic knowledge that we have to feed of the knowledge of Christ. Then we need to be frequently refilled with the Holy Spirit practicing power, right? Which is like gasoline. And, and we all, it's, a, it's a good ex analogy because it's so, so common that, that when you run out of gas on the highway, it's like, what happened to my car? And so, oh, oh. The needle says empty. I ignored the needle. When, it, when the little light came on, I ignored it, right? Okay, here's a question for you all. How many of you have held the fuel pump from a car or a truck in your hand? How many, how many of you have actually done that? All right. Okay, some, some have seen it, but they've never actually held one in their hands. Okay, what does the fuel pump do? The fuel pump gets the energy liquid from the gas tank. Presumably you put it in there, so let's say it's in there, right? When you turn on your ignition, the fuel pump starts pumping, right? And so it, it brings fuel from the gas tank through the fuel pump and up to the engine where it's going to blow up <laughs> or be harnessed and create energy. And then you can stick it into gear and accelerate and everything is wonderful. So Jesus says, he who feeds on me will live because of me. That's like the fuel pump connection. If you don't, if your fuel pump isn't there or if it stops working, then your whole car stops running down the road, right? Because you can't drive your car. You don't have the energy. You don't have the fuel. We need daily to draw knowledge and energy, right? It's not just knowledge we're looking for. It's spiritual energy from the Jesus connection. And he wants us. We have to learn 
He wants us, he wants us, he loves us so much, Passover, unleavened bread, feed on my knowledge, and, and festival of Holy Spirit or festival of weeks, we call it Pentecost, is drink in of the spirit, the mind power spirit that I will give you to be overcoming and then practice overcoming and then get good at overcoming and stay good at overcoming and be faithful until the very end. Ephesians 5.18 Interesting. He says, don't be drunk with wine. Okay, how does one get drunk? Some of you know how to get drunk. How do you get drunk? You drink too much. Okay, if I, if I had some vodka in here or some rum, or what's even stronger than rum? What's, what's really strong? 100% VGA. Who, what's that? 100% pure grain alcohol. Pure grain alcohol. So say I had this full of pure, you know, if I drink, gobble the whole thing down, would I probably get drunk or throw up or be sick real quick? Okay, if I just went, <laughs> sip, right? Am I going to be drunk after sip? No, right? So what is Paul saying? He's saying, don't drink so much. Don't have so plenteous amount of alcohol, right, to get drunk. He didn't say, don't drink alcohol. He said, don't drink so much alcohol that it's going to make you drunk. On the other hand, what he's saying is, don't be doing that and do be doing, be filled with the Spirit. And, and I thought, I've got, I got to look at the Greek here. So I put the Greek definition in the handout there. And it says, to make replete. Well, that's good. What's that? <laughs> then it says, to cram. Okay, how many of you have crammed for a test? Some of you surely have crammed for a test, right? What is cramming for a test? It's like you're putting in as much as you could possibly put in. Okay, so if you're going to get drunk, you cram. Right? You cram in a whole bunch of alcohol. And, and you know, and then, woo! Now I'm drunk. So he's saying, don't be doing the drunk thing. Do be cramming in the Holy Spirit. Well, how do we cram in the Holy Spirit? Um, we think like Jesus more and more. We grow stronger at thinking like Jesus more and more. A, in Passover, we trust that he loves us beyond a shadow of a doubt. Right? We never, ever question that he loved us so much. He came and shed his blood and died so we would have the opportunity. Then he gave us unleavened bread, which most people go, I don't want that, and that's okay. We'll see you in the second resurrection a thousand years after the first resurrection. Right? So seven complete periods of festival of weeks are designed, that's the, the up to, leading up to Pentecost, are designed to show that we can stay strong in Christ if we continue to have spiritual energy to do the heavy lifting of overcoming evil with good. Now, you know, Gary's not been well, and he's been weak, and he shouldn't be doing heavy lifting, right? Whenever you get sick, you need chicken noodle soup, you don't need to be doing a whole bunch of heavy lifting. So, so Jesus is saying, if you keep, you know, keep refreshing the knowledge of Jesus Christ and what he wants you doing, and then you keep asking for the Holy Spirit and you apply the Holy Spirit, Right? Like you apply gasoline. First of all, you put it in your tank. Then you make sure your fuel pump's working and you turn on the ignition and that turns on the fuel pump. And, and then as long as everything else is working in your engine, then you apply the gas, the foot on the, on the accelerator, and which saved my life a time or two in my trips this last few weeks. You know, it's like there's a semi next to me and several cars pushing my bumper bar. <laughs> and I'm going, who cares about the speed limit? wham, on the accelerator, pull out, get in front of the semi, and then drop back to the speed limit of the, of the semi, and all these people come past me like they're NASCAR drivers, you know, <laughs> racing each other to pass and pass and pass, and, you know, crazy. Anyhow, so um, it's, it's spiritual fuel and effort to understand the knowledge and then effort to apply the spiritual fuel that we must expend to live continuous godly lives and that's what being faithful unto death is. John explains it in 1 John 3.10 In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Now you know this could be, look out this could be dangerous here. Right? Whoever does not practice righteousness 
Okay, what did, what did we do for unleavened bread? Because Jesus said and Father said, leaven and leaven products are sin for seven days, starting here, ending here, ending tonight at sunset. It's sin. Now, scientifically, you can't prove that leaven is sin. You can't. Scientifically, it doesn't change from tonight or from now to the other side of sunset tonight. It doesn't change. Scientifically, you can't prove that. The only reason it's sin is because God said so. And the reason we do what we do is because we obey what God said so. And that's how you get salvation. You do what God said so, right? And most people mix. And God said, don't mix. And they go, ah, he's a sweetie. He won't mind if I mix a little. Oh, yeah, he will. And how do you know that? How do we know that? Because he gave us a whole huge seven-day festival of eating special or peculiar bread, right? And avoid eating, shutting, and staying away from the regular stuff. And that lesson sticks in our head. And the spiritual lesson is supposed to stick in our head too. So we make the effort to expend, to, you know, have to make an effort. Because it's not just learn the knowledge and then don't make the effort to live the knowledge. So he says, children of God, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Uh-oh, there's not a lot of wiggle room in that, is there? Right, now you can practice it 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold, but you do need to be practicing the righteousness of God. So you've got to be studying to find out what the righteousness of God is. And it doesn't take very long for those who want to know to find, keep the days of unleavened bread. But two billion people are going, I don't have to do that. That's Jewish. You know, Paul heard it from Jesus, taught the Gentiles in the New Testament, which everybody loves the New Testament, you know, and there it is. Keep the feast of unleavened bread. I don't want to do that. Okay. So you don't want to practice righteousness. So what does this say? You're not of God nor is he who does not love his brother, right? So knowing what should be done and having the energy power to do it are two different things. And, and you know, the older I get, the less energy I have <laughs> and the less I want to do things, right? But thank God, it's a spiritual battle. You know, turning off the TV or not, you know, closing your eyes when you walk through the checkout stand or, you know, are spiritual things, and if you're connected and you're excited about Jesus' plan, then, then he gives you spiritual energy even though you're running low on physical energy. So Paul and the Festival of Weeks teach us to be filled often with God's Holy